We'll now move on to hearing from our next speaker, Dr. Theodore. Dr. Theodore is the Vice President of Scientific Innovation, Therapeutic Area Expert, and Thoracic Surgical Oncology for Johnson & Johnson. He also serves as the Chair of Thoracic Surgery at UCS UCSF. He has over two decades of experience in cardiothoracic surgery, surgical education, entrepreneurship, and innovation. He is also a commander in the Naval Reserves. Dr. Theodore. Great. Thanks very much. So a quick correction. Uh, I held an endowed chair previously at the University of California at San Francisco. The uh, current chair is a very dear friend of mine, Julie, who is now in that position at present. And I um, at, at currently am an adjunct clinical associate professor at cardiac surgery at uh, Stanford University. But my primary role is in industry, in industry. So to jump right in, I'd love to um, take some time today to talk a little bit about the role of industry in medical device innovation in low resource settings and give you some thoughts, if you will, sort of from a um, kind of a broad perspective on how one goes from having an idea in one's mind as to what could be transformative in low resource setting to passing through the variety of regulatory and commercial and even cultural hurdles to the point that this can be an adopted technology in low resource settings. I think it's always reasonable to start off with one of the popes of of uh, global health with uh, Dr. Farmer here and his reflection that this is an exciting time for surgery and because it really is a form of global health equity. And I think one of the things that Paul and many others, Jim Kim, the former uh, president of the World Bank have pointed out is that there's no such thing as having an adequate delivery of global health without having global surgical infrastructure in place. Most of the people on this call are are part of our sort of, we're sort of preaching a little bit to the choir, and yet this is an important message for us to continue to, if you will, beat the drum, to, to deliver the message that there is no delivering of global health goals without surgical infrastructure in place. And this is why clinical research is so important to drive home that message, and I hope that will be a little bit of a theme today. So what I'd like to talk to, and this is the, the agenda I'd love to uh, run by you today. And the first is to talk about this notion of a market failure that you will often hear. And I can assure you, this is an argument and this is a, this is a pushback that I hear almost on a daily basis inside of a medical, the medical device industry, which is that for one reason or another, there is no way to actually develop and bring to market products that can be successful in low resource environments, at least with respect to medical devices. So I'd like to address that issue sort of head on and give you some thoughts, maybe somewhat philosophical thoughts, but some maybe food for thought as we address this idea of a market failure for medical devices in low resource setting. And then I'd also like to address what you might call a surgical desert. I initially had written this as surgical desserts, but then had to uh, do the spell, spell check on it. And the idea is that even in middle and low resource environments, there are particular areas where there is an under uh, an underdevelopment and under expression, if you will, of medical devices and engagement from the medical device industry. And I'd like to address that. And, and it, it actually builds on one of the previous questions is a fundamental understanding of what you might call the iron triangle of healthcare. And at the risk of oversimplification in higher resource environments, you really have three levers that you can pull. You can make something of higher quality. You can make it that it has more access to more patients or you can try to reduce the cost. So are you hearing me okay? And then I'm gonna kind of pick up by just going over the agenda for the discussion here, which is I wanted to talk about uh, this notion of market failure in low resource settings, what I consider to be surgical de deserts, where the need is truly greatest, even within a lower middle income country, and then reflect on what are the levers that one can pull in, in higher and middle income countries and how that may differ a little bit in low resource settings with respect to what's known as the iron triangle or balancing quality, access, and cost. And then the last, the last um, topic I'd like to, to express and to transmit, if I may, to, particularly to medical students or people interested in medical device development, is thinking through how to create effectively a bullseye graph in innovation, whereby you have a sense for exactly what is at the center where you want to focus in terms of medical devices that you think are, are, are appropriate or necessary in low resource settings. So it, it, we would be uh, remiss if we didn't sort of talk a bit about the burden that we face. Many of these numbers have already been discussed. They pretty much come out of the Lancet Global Commission report. I won't, re I won't reiterate each of them. I do wanna draw attention to a couple. The, the first is 
this notion that there are 95 million children who are born each year with a congenital disability. In low resource environments, it's often the case that children are almost seen in a sense as being an expendable resource, which is a, which is a truly um, regrettable statement to make. But the notion that you can have lifelong correction with uh, pediatric surgical interventions, I think is notable and to make, and to be really aware of the fact that there are, there are tens of millions, nearly 100 million children born with disabilities per annum. At the bottom is this classic number of 5 billion patients without access to surgical care. I've actually always been a little troubled by this number, to be frank. And the reason why I've been troubled by this number is, first of all, that is the lion's share of humanity. And the second is that, frankly, of that 5 billion, most do actually not need surgical intervention. And so what I've tried to focus on is the 300 million cases that are actually performed per year and the lack of representation in low resource settings. So the overwhelming number of those cases, 75% plus, are performed in, in, in countries with high and middle, inco high and middle income GDPs. So, so I, I sort of put this in context that sort of get us away from this notion of 5 billion, which I think can be a misleading number. We can discuss that for, for a bit, perhaps at the end. I want to give a little bit of a uh, reflection on this idea of a market failure. And what I've done here is I've put some technologies in surgical space, in the surgical space, and I've put them opposed to technologies that are often available in the, in the, that's called the military industrial complex space, for which no one ever says that there is a market failure. So for example, on the left, this is, uh, this is Secretary McNamara during the Vietnam War around in the wardroom making plans with respect to bombing in Southeast Asia. On the right side, you have a, a typical tumor board and evaluation of a case. Of a case. Um, the second one down on the left, you have the Predator drone. That, that drone um, development cost is upwards, upwards of $50 billion. Each one of those devices is $100 million. On the right, this is an example of, on the of a a robotically directed bronchoscopic system that we've invested in. To the bottom, to the bottom left, you see um, an example of a, uh, this is an actually an F-14 uh, um, plane taking off from a carrier. The current um, fighter jets from the US Navy, the F-35, the cost of that program is $1.2 trillion. And so when you start to think about the development cost that go into this, and then you hear the argument, somehow there is not a market for medical, re it's not so much that there isn't a market, it's that we haven't been able to make this jump to sort of drive the same sort of brilliance and ingenuity from this surgical industrial uh, sort of system into a military or a device industrial system. And we get there through clinical research. We get there through making the case to ministries of health and ministries of finance to start to change national perspective from military focus to more healthcare focused. This is, a, this is a concept that I like to drive home for how often medical device and large pharmaceutical companies see their commercial priorities versus social impact priorities. Um, this bicycle in the middle is called a penny farthing bike. This is what all bicycles look like until the sort of the end of the 19th century. A very big wheel in the front and a tiny little wheel in the back. It's a very inefficient way uh, to move a bicycle. As soon as this was changed where the two wheels were of similar size with a chain between the two, of course, that revolutionized bicycling. If you think of something like the Wright Brothers was initially a bicycle company before it was an airplane company. So one of our objectives, and, and I'll go to what we're trying to do in Johnson & Johnson, is to try to equalize a little bit of these two wheels. We, start, we stop seeing social impact priorities as something that we do as a residuum to our commercial priorities and actually see them almost on an equal footing. And to get there, this is a slide that I actually made for myself when I first joined the Global Public Health Group at Johnson & Johnson, which is try to understand that for in the, in the for-profit sector, we have one portion of the business to the far right, which are our commercial business units. There are names like Ethicons, Ethicon or Oris Robotics um, that, or Depew Synthes, and the the true measure of success for these commercial business units is their net profit. On the far left-hand side, we have our foundation. Each year where we take money off of the balance sheet and we and effectively give that money away, largely to frontline healthcare workers, where we're trying to develop a net impact. One dollar spend, we hope, will generate one dollar of impact. But in between the two is, I think, if you will, where the magic happens, which is where we try to create 
but we can bring differentiated innovation to low resource setting and then bring in partners for implementation, be they academic or more in the public space. So for example, we brought to market a, a treatment strategy for tuberculosis, uh, bringing a drug called bedaquiline, which is the first drug in 40 years to be marketed for tuberculosis. There was no margin around this, pop, this, this product. And in fact, it was being abandoned by all the pharma industry, but by coupling with USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates and others, we were able to bring it to market. And now it is the, the first line of choice for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So that is in a way our, our model that we now wish to sort of translate into the surgical device space. I mentioned this concept of deserts earlier, and what I wanna drive home here is that even in lower resource settings, there are regions where there are a high degree of surgical skill that can be delivered. So, you know, at Malago Hospital in Kampala, Uganda, in, uh, the, in the university hospitals in Accra, for example, you can find world-class world-class medical center or medical care being delivered at these higher level hospitals to the far right. But you'll notice it's actually a relatively small fraction of the surgical procedures. As you travel either conceptually or geographically away from these higher level hospitals, often in the capital, to where 80% of the case surgical cases are being performed, there's a marked drop off in quality in quality, in educational initiatives and training. And as a consequence, when we talk about poor outcomes, it's largely as a result of these first level district hospitals. In my mind, when we think about tools that allow for increased training, uh, increased care delivery, improved outcome, focusing on these first level district hospitals in my mind are, if you will, the, the surgical deserts, even inside of a low or a middle income country. So when we look across what I consider to be the, the pillars of, of innovation in essential surgery, it looks something like this. The four major pillars in my mind are around, initially is workforce strengthening. It was mentioned earlier by Dr. Mock about the surgical obstetrics and anesthesia provider density. And really, as long as there aren't a sufficient number of providers with sufficient skills, it's hard to imagine uh, largely increasing the, the quality of surgical care that's delivered. But secondarily, advocacy and surgical action plans at the federal level are, are critical. And this is a role that specifically that medical device companies can, can play, really kind of raising the voice around the importance to add surgical care and surgical infrastructure as part of a, of a, of a functioning healthcare plan, a healthcare system. And as we move to the right, I think these are the places where medical device companies can truly play a fundamental role. The first is in creative finance and impact investment. So creating, for example, social impact funds, getting the right sets of partners to the table that are able to bring together capital that can deploy to develop medical devices in low resource settings. And one thing that I think is particularly interesting is trying to set up effectively bond initiatives to make surgical disease and global health priorities effectively investable opportunities. And then as we finally move off to the right, the sort of the core, I suppose, of of, a, of medical device success is around transformative innovation. And this is where we turn to challenges where we reach out to academic medical centers. We have another being launched this year, the African Innovation uh, Challenge. We have a diversity initiative challenge that's focusing on medical devices this year. where We look to provide prizes for those that are trying to bring, even at the very early stages of ideation, important ideas uh, into the medical marketplace. We have a Center for Device Innovation, which is part of the Texas Medical Center in Houston, where from the ground floor, we can begin to um, develop, medical develop medical devices with sufficient uh, engineering resources. And finally, sometimes it's not a question of being the smartest person, if you will, in the room, but how do you get some of the products and services to those who are most in need? And this largely becomes an issue of supply chain and logistics innovation. So there's plenty of room for medical device companies to engage in this domain as well. Again, these, these are, in my mind, the four effective pillars of surgical intervention. And, and in a sense, they also represent a little bit of a spectrum from pure philanthropy, where essentially what we're doing is taking money off of the balance sheet to try to train and educate, all the way over to bringing new forms of innovative technologies that in, in an ideal world can actually form part of what we call reverse innovation, where they even become relevant in low resource settings. A good example of that in the medical device space would be General Electric and its use, for example, of mobile ultrasound, where, for example, in just about every 
emergency department in the United States, you now have focused abdominal ultrasonography of trauma. And this is in large part that portable form of ultrasonography comes from some of the demands from low resource settings. So I said earlier that I wanted to address this idea of the of the sort of the, the iron triangle of innovation in healthcare that we really have three major, uh, three major levers that we can pull, quality access and cost. But the truth is that in low resource settings, this becomes a little bit, a little bit more complicated. Improving the access is critical, but so too is cost effective and high quality delivery. I wanna, by the way, before going forward, I want to also draw attention to the reference for these two figures. I thought this paper, and if you can screenshot this, and I can, I'm happy to send these slides out at the end, but I think this is a really fantastic reference about uh, developing in low resource settings. So I did want to draw, uh, draw attention to the source for these two images. But in my mind, the idea of widening access and cost effectiveness is really table stakes. In low resource settings, making sure that these are culturally appropriate, and this requires a certain form of innovative thinking and design process that can only be described as empathy. It, it requires boots in the ground. It requires actually listening to what the fundamental problems that are being faced by clinicians each day, whether it be cost, whether it be the cultural appropriateness of devices for screening for cervical cancer, for example, and effectively uh, innovating around the specific uh, market specific needs of clinicians. So this idea of the iron triangle becomes a bit more complicated in low resource settings. And I'd like to focus when we turn to this right-sided triangle, we sort of look at research technology and collaboration is the, is the incredible importance of clinical research. The clinical research effectively becomes the argument before the ministries of health and the ministries of finance to ultimately engage in reimbursement for medical devices. And this becomes critical. This can be boiled down to sort of a four-step process of, of uh, carefully defining the market needs. I think that really before going too far, always discussion. Um, I think Ray mentioned before, sort of sitting down with, sitting down sort of face-to-face, -face, often even in non-clinical environments, really to discuss what the clinical needs are is an absolute critical place to start to define innovation strategy. We, we often begin with a, a landscape, and I'll show you an example of that in the next slide, but we try to get a sense for what is available, both internally, that is inside of a company, and those that are in the external innovation landscape. What are the startups, and what are they, what are they doing that could be valuable in a low resource setting? And then this leads to really what you would call a research and development effort in terms of making a direct investment in companies that show promise, simply procuring if they're procuring uh, devices if that's what's needed to advance a program and then internal innovation when we feel like our best our best way of developing these medical devices is by developing them inside of the walls of a device company and i cannot as i mentioned earlier I, when i say demonstrate i think that's really a euphemism for clinical research research is that is that the key to right up front thinking about monitoring and evaluation and the metrics that are required to demonstrate value in low resource settings so I, I want to, towards the end here, I want to sort of suggest what a, what I call a bullseye graph looks like with respect to medical innovation in low resource settings. And what this really comes down to is understanding domains in which you wish to, to, to innovate, whether it be obstetrics or wound closure or imaging technologies, infrastructure and the like. And then to, to, to after surveying both internally, if you're in a medical device company or understanding the landscape or what your individual effort may, may look like in academia, and then to be able to place that in a kind of a bullseye graph. In my mind, with the center of the bullseye being something that's close to being ready for, 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 the, for the market, you know, this is um, not the best time to go through the, all the regulatory hurdles that are required to get to a market of technology. But I think thinking through opportunities from a bullseye perspective when resources are limited, allows us to focus on the technologies that show the most value and the most potential to have impact in low resource settings. You know, I, I always think it's important to, to bring this back to a personal story that keeps us motivated and keeps me personally motivated. Um, we introduced the idea of minimally invasive thoracic surgery in Haiti not long after the earthquake now, several years ago. This is one of the first cases of just really simply an empyema in the, in the young woman to the right, the pediatric case with a collapsed lung, admitted chronically with a chest tube. And really that, that 
that sort of you know reinflation and getting to see a patient, individual patient. And that for me, I, the reason why I end with this is I guess I'm speaking mostly to the medical students and residents. There will be some very difficult parts of our, or elements of the road ahead. And you will need to hold on to sometimes individual patients that have meaning for you. That is often what will get you to, through some of the hardest times that, we will, that you will encounter in your future. I think there is a lot of possibility for global surgery, not just as a means of addressing clinical needs, of course that's first and foremost, but truly as a development strategy for low resource, low least, low resource countries. If you go back to that military slide I showed earlier, it's that, that progressive movement where we focus on medical device innovation, I think is, one of, is in our future. I thanks for the time and I look forward to your questions and any discussion that will ensue. Thank you so much, Dr. Theodore, for your thoughts. I thought that was really interesting, the sort of bridging the gap between philanthropy and uh, market returns while still being focused on uh, the individual patients. Um, that, was, that was very insightful. Um, would you, the first question that we have is, would you be able to give us an example of what Johnson & Johnson has done to implement a device in a foreign countries? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So there's been a couple of specific efforts that we've made that we, we think show promise. I'll, I'll run through, say, three, for example. The first is we've invested, uh, we put money into, actually, it's non-dilutive, so it's essentially a grant into a Nigerian blood banking uh, system called LifeBank, which we think has the potential to revolutionize the, revolutionize the capacity to deliver safe blood products in low-resource settings. The second is that, um, see, last year, uh, no, actually, it's a, over a year ago now, we uh, acquired a company called Surgical Process Institute in, that's a German company that essentially tries to streamline activities in the operating theater. Uh, and then we have deployed that in Tanzania, which is just getting off the ground now, but we've just started entering patients into a trial using a digital tool in a low resource setting to streamline operative processes to try to reduce the risk of complications, um, the complications, uh, even uh, wound infections as a consequence of, in a very sort of uh, disciplined way, trying to address surgical processes intraoperatively. So those would be a couple of examples of specific uh, innovations and investments that we've made at J&J. Thank you for sharing those experiences. Um, our next question is from Julius. He says, in this new technological era, era, I feel that there is a huge lack of collaboration and intraprofessional interprofessional collaboration. Can you tell us how we can approach this and actually get different groups of people to work together, collaborate and look into global issues instead of profit-driven initiatives? Well, you know, I, I think that, that I'm not sure that it's profit-driven is necessarily the issue. I think the questions fu fundamentally is about how can we collaborate and work together uh, more effectively. One thing I think is really reassuring is that we, it would be silly for me to contend that we're not profit driven, but we are highly collaborative. And if there are solutions that we cannot bring or that we need partnership to move forward, then we are constantly looking to partner to move, to move efforts forward. So a, a good example would be, say, um, in uh, bringing, for example, like for the Bedaclin example I brought earlier, partnering directly with USAID, we work directly with other farm companies. We have, for example, an agent inhaled oxytocin that was initially brought, was initially developed by GlaxoSmithKline. We made a partnership directly with them in order to continue to develop that agent. So I think there's a lot of room for collaboration in industry. And so it doesn't mean that we're, you know, siloed and driven solely by profit. Yeah, uh, kind of going along with that, making that shift to uh, having funding focused on medical device innovation and implementing that, um, what are some things that you can suggest that we could help convince voters and taxpayers to support something like that? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. The, I must say, the device companies do have a fair degree of sway among lobbyists, at least, in the, at least in the domestic, in the U.S. political system. So there is some cap capacity to lobby even for global surgical initiatives. So there have been global surgical initiatives where device companies have been able to have some sway among legislators. So, so I think that really, I think we all have some responsibility to reach out to our representatives. That's what they're there for. And actually global health and global health priorities are among those issues that our legislators face. So I think directly reaching out to our 
both local and national legislators is one approach that we can take in order to advocate for global surgery. Certainly, and I, I think that is definitely a responsibility that we all have um, as future physicians or as practicing physicians who are also tuned in. Uh, our final question comes from Ellie. She says, you spoke about bond initiatives and how to make surgery investable. Can you expand on some of these strategies? Yeah, that's, it's, an, it's an interesting concept, which is, and it, it boils down to a simple notion that fixing global health priorities has true value, um, both healthcare and economic value, and that countries are willing to pay or let's say outcome funders are willing to pay to support efforts that address those global health priorities successfully. And if you can set up a structure which is effectively pay for a pay for performance model, then investors can actually find a return on addressing significant clinical, clinical issues. So that's the, that at least is the concept. And I would encourage those interested to to search uh, under, for example, uh, social impact bonds or development in impact bonds for more information. Well, Dr. Theodore, we, we really appreciate your time today. Uh, we're so grateful for you to do that, even though you're kind of trying to transition back home. We know you're on the East Coast, so thank you so much. Uh, we're going to invite Dr. Wren and Dr. Mock and Dr. Price back on if you all want to share your, your screens and your audio. If anyone had any final comments or wanted to say anything to each other, feel free to kind of take a few minutes and it, we'll see if we have any final questions to go over. So I'd love to uh, ask Dr. Theodore a question. Um, I noticed you discussed the 5 billion number and I was glad to hear you say that. Um, that number has been put out there as almost a uh, religious number and okay. I've had an issue with that number. I think most people don't actually know how the number was achieved. It was based on how many people could get to care by an ambulance, have a um, um, pulse ox, and have um, no excessive expenditures. Do you think the 5 billion number is actually hurting global surgery right now? Because it's so big, as you said, it's almost, you know, it's a huge percent of the population. So could we discuss, and I'd love to have Charlie, Dr. Mock on that, Dr. Price on that. I, I actually think the 5 billion number is hurting us. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd open that up to discussion. I entirely agree. I think that it becomes the type of the type of um, comment or number that tends to almost turn off advocates because it seems too vast when in fact there are if you will more addressable markets of hundreds of millions of, of patients who are not getting adequate surgical care so i i do think that to some degree that number in a sense does us a disservice so i'd be curious to get everyone else's thoughts charlie what do you, where do you come in on this yeah, I agree. I tend uh, not to reference that too much for all the same reasons you mentioned. And out of the 5 billion, probably the largest single chunk of people don't reach the definition of access because of uh, formal pre-hospital care. Mm -hmm. when, when that's important, but still, um, and, and it's, you know, within that 5 billion, it's not all or none. There are many people that just have no access at all many people who, for whom it's available, but just too expensive, right. et cetera. So I tend not to use that. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's worth going back and revising it, you know, because it'd be kind of multifaceted and nuanced to get a answer because it's just not all or none. Uh, but once again, I tend not to quote that too much. Whereas I think the, some of the other things that came from the Lancet Commission, such as the uh, uh, benchmarks for a number of providers and number of operations per population per year, uh, those are uh, fairly realistic uh, and give an idea that it's, you know, those sort of levels are achievable and that you can get uh, substantial population-wide uh, impact uh, without needing to get anywhere near the number of providers or procedures of high-income countries. One of the things you referenced, I think is very important, which is the 80 million who are thrown into a state of catastrophic expenditure and poverty as a consequence of paying for surgical care. 
And I think that's important. The reason why I think that is so important, and it happens obviously in high resource settings as well, is that, is that risk of poverty is one of the principal reasons why, for one reason or another, surgery is, quote, not accessed, is because it's really a trade-off between surgical care delivery or throwing sometimes an entire family into a state of poverty, and hence the importance of advocating for bu healthcare bundles that include basic access to surgical care. Yeah, one of my thoughts, uh, I think that 5 billion number is always misquoted as well. I hear everybody say 5 billion people lack access to surgical care, and that's what that number is not. 5 billion people don't, you know, they lack access to surgical care within two hours. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very interesting concept. Uh, we uh, hopefully shortly will be publishing a paper. We've been looking at trying to collect all six of the indicators uh, uh, for Mongolia, actual numbers, not just uh, estimates, and using uh, GIS kind of coordinates for even access. Uh, there's an article, and Tom Weiser has a, a nice map that says 80% of Mongolia is covered, um, but it didn't take into account the dirt roads and the mountains and the <laughs> Um, or the weather that happens uh, uh, so cold in the wintertime or those kinds of things that um, so so I, I agree I think that five billion number is actually misquoted and, and, and misused and misunderstood as to what that really is and because um, uh, truly there, there there may be five billion people that don't have access to quality surgical care within two hours but in some areas is that that may be important in, in trauma, but is it important for a lot of the surgical care? I'm not, I'm not so sure, so. So I have a, um, a thought too, you know, the, the, uh, the, there's a question earlier about what made us successful in Mongolia. We would not have been successful long-term for the transition uh, of the healthcare system to adopt laparoscopy if industry had not been involved. Uh, this was a real struggle to try to figure out how we, we do this. We sat down actually with Mrs. Stortz. How do we, uh, now that you've donated this equipment, what's the business model that's gonna support this within the country? Uh, what's affordable? Uh, who, who is setting up that business model? There's still one of the surgeons that was set up as a Covidian distributorship uh, because there was no access to the supplies that we needed until we developed those supplies and 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 so maybe uh, again to, to Pierre as well uh, you know the concept of making surgery available in resource poor countries has to include a business model um, and and that and that balance between you know obviously there's there's profit there's business but it's it's not going to work for sustainability without a business model. What are your thoughts? I, I think that's true. I think that the, the business model becomes, it, it's really a question of, even the term business model can sometimes be a little misleading. I think the term that you use is the better one. What is a sustainability model? Right. What, what is the model that we can put in place that means that as I sometimes say, the supply chain means from a surgeon's perspective, when you ask for an instrument, you put your hand out, does that instrument hit your hand? You know, you, you turn on the faucet, does water come out? The, the, in order to have those sustainable systems in place requires some degree of profitability to maintain them. So in my mind, the, the, goal, yeah. the drive is not, if you will, if you'll allow this, the drive is not the profitability. Mm -hmm. The drive is the sustainability. And the means to get there is by having a system that lends some degree of profitability to some of the some of the members of the people along that supply chain. So, so I would agree with you entirely, Ray. I, th I think you said it much better than I did. <laughs> uh, Sherry, I'm going to ask you a question though. You, you you mentioned you know one of the key things is for data collection in this uh, effort, um, and that nobody has done that. And this is one of the biggest challenges I think we all face is appropriate data collection. And you're talking about in really, sub, not just resource poor, but in uh, uh, politically challenging environments. Um, is it that it hasn't been done because this is a, a, such a major challenge 
And how do we, how do we overcome that challenge to get the data that we need, even in that most uh, severe uh, environment? What's the solution? Yeah, I think that data in this day and age, you can collect um, with the type of handheld devices. It's, it is absolutely doable. I think there's concerns about data. You can imagine, depending on what context you're in, knowing where a person comes from may put them more at risk, what religion they may be and things. So you're gonna to have to be very judicious in what type of data elements. The, most of these groups are actually collecting data. Everybody's seen some of the reports that have come out um, with MSF data. I myself has published on with MSF data. The problem is, is what's the quality of the data and what will actually be shared. Um, one of the biggest surprises that I found when we did a, a report using MSF data was their definition of surgical mortality was you lived, you were alive when you left the PACU. Now, I don't think anybody sitting around here would agree that that's a kind of typical outcome of post-operative death is you survive to leave the PACU. So I think, I think people are, might be worried about the data, right? If you're MSF and 85% of your funds are coming from individual donors, I think, you know, as a community, surgeons, we've worried about our data getting publicly reported and things like that because it actually does drive things. So I think there's a lot of concerns about collecting data, but I think we have to get past it and we have to get to a data set. I think that it's kind of crazy that it's 2020 and we really don't have any idea what the true surgical need is in almost any of the settings any of us are talking about here. I mean, think about it. It's the, the conflict zone just makes it even more difficult, but we're talking about what is the surgical need in any of these countries. Data is gonna be the key. That's why I hope guys like uh, Charlie and his team, because they are the data gurus are gonna maybe help us on this or other teams, but uh, I don't know, Charlie, how do you see a way forward on this? Uh, I, I, no, it's happening <laughs> gradually. Gradually, we're getting better and more complete data. Uh, I think there's more awareness of it's important on the local scene in many institutions. And uh, I think WHO, especially the injury unit, is doing a great job at promoting, you know, minimum data set type stuff. And they each, they've even created their own burn registry, international burn registry for countries around the world. And they have multiple institutions contributing data to it. And they're trying to set up something similar for all of trauma. So I, I think it's coming along. Uh, you know, increasing awareness of the use and importance of the data are important. You know, a lot of times when we talk about like a trauma registry and an individual institution, too much of the time what you see written about is somebody from the outside goes in and gathers data for six months and it's really complete and they write some papers and they call it a trauma registry and that's quite <laughs> different than uh, institutions having and using their own data for their own purposes such as for quality improvement or or even just better awareness of resource utilization oftentimes those data you know that's what really needs to be done and so i think uh, outside groups really ought to be thinking more about helping along that process making sure the data are used and not so much getting data that's really high quality for six months and publishing on it so pierre Obviously, industry is really good at getting data. You project markets and all sorts of things. Have they been, have J&J or anybody been able to kind of get a more reasonable kind of estimate of need? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And I would say that we don't really have a fundamental handle on the need. We, we estimate need based largely on the National Surgical Obstetrics and Action Plans. And we use that to try to help us to categorize not just need broadly in the country, but even individually by province, sometimes even down to level of hospital. And that in large part depends on the you know, program for global surgery and social change's effort to really promote this idea of surgical action plans forming effectively 
a business plan for the development of surgical um, infrastructural changes in low resource settings. So we tend to rely on the countries themselves to try to uh, categorize the need. So I've, uh, um, I just noticed a question here from uh, 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 Jonathan Walsh. Uh, by the way, I, sorry to interrupt, but I have to sign off. Somebody, I, I set up a call that I'm late for, so I'm, so I'm going to have to sign off. So bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Charlie. All right, thank hey, you. Hey, Charlie. By the thank way, you. I did get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. And my camera didn't work so well. <laughs> so I see a question here. Do you run into conflicts between pressure for short-term returns, profitability? and the goal of long-term sustainable results. And I put that not just in terms of uh, uh, financial, uh, but as we go to uh, get funding to do our various projects, um, have, you, have I know we have found challenges with people say, hey, here's some funds to use. We'd like to see some X, Y, and Z to happen in this next year and yeah. report on it. But getting people to have a view of what's done in what we've done in Mongolia, a 15-year engagement, is much more much more difficult. So, Sherry, Pierre, what what thoughts do you have on that? I think it's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. Sherry, you want to take a crack at it, and I can give I, a. I, I was typing a response to a different <laughs> one, so I'm going to let you go on that one. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. And so this is critically important. The the brief answer is it's always a struggle when business leaders, commercial leaders, are trying to balance their short-term priorities and you're making arguments around long-term market creation. Yeah. The good news is that the larger the organization, sometimes they are capable of actually considering reputational issues and reputational risk as well. So we do things like, uh, we call them our health for humanity goals that are actually stretched over five and 10, sometimes even further. So if there is a reputational benefit that we can gain from engaging around, around such projects, we consider that to be critically important. And in fact, that's part of the reason why we engage in, in philanthropy in the first place. The first reason is because it's the right thing. The second is because it reflects well on the organization as to what we're trying to achieve in the world. So there's that the answer is it's always difficult. There's always a trade off, trade off with short term realities. However, there is a reputational benefit that's longer term that we sometimes that we think is worth the investment. Do you think we should give our organizers first? I'd like to thank them for I mean, this is incredible to have pulled this all off. So kudos to you, but do you guys have a question for us? You, you've got a, eight great minds sitting there. <laughs> I think actually due to time constraints, we might actually have to close. Sure. But we, we hesitate to interrupt because we realize how valuable all of your perspectives are. So we thank you and appreciate you joining us. And we have the team here, not the whole team could make it, but we appreciate you guys making the time for us and teaching us, so. Let's all get back to that social distancing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just, Thank you, you very just, much. This is really I just want people topic. to know it truly was organized by the medical students, run by the medical students, and the challenges that came up fixed by, by the medical students. I, uh, phenomenal job, guys. Um, uh, this is an example of what I'm talking about. When the challenges face us, we find solutions. Nice job. Truly. Second that. Everybody stay safe, too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so very much for the day. Thank you all. Thank you. See you, Sherry and Pierre. Bye. Bye, Bye Sherry.